This podcast is brought to you by the corn herbicide solutions from Corteva AgriScience. Hello, I'm Ken Root. Thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about spring considerations for corn farmers, and joining me are Ron Geis, who's a market development specialist with Corteva AgriScience, and Nate Levan, an agronomist with Pioneer. Both are located in Iowa, which at the time we're having this is a very cold place. I hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, Thanks for being here. Ron, tell me, how are you doing? No, doing good. Trying to stay warm. Yeah. And Nate? Uh, Very good. Thanks for the call today. Do both of you believe that spring will come? (laughs) It always does, Ken. It's taking its time, but you know, we, we sure had a nice November, December, and January to get some field work done and anhydrous put on so that those were good signs that spring is on the way. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because every farmer is ready for spring, but I think every farmer understands that if you don't prep ahead in the fall, you can really get yourself caught because of either too wet or too dry or too much to do. Ron, I'll start with you. What do you think that uh, farmers were able to accomplish last fall that will benefit them this spring? Well, some of our no-till farmers, uh, particularly in the southern part of Iowa, were able to get some fall herbicide work done, which was a uh, a, a good thing. The weeds in the fall are small and easy to, to control. And uh, also a lot of anhydrous ammonia was put on, which was, was good um, to take care of that chore early in the season. As long as it was stabilized, it should be good and ready to go when the corn needs it later on this season. Nate, um both you guys work a bigger area than just Iowa. Uh, do you feel like much of the Midwest was a, able to accomplish similar things to Iowa farmers this past fall? Yeah, I have to agree with Ron. Uh, compared to previous seasons, um, you know, specifically 2018 and 2019, uh, a lot of guys I think are going into the spring of 2020 with a, a better feeling about what that seed bed's going to look like. The ability to to get some of that fall work done, um, if anything, just to make sure that there's not so much to be going on in the springtime was huge. Um, so yeah, I, I think that over a wider area, you know, there's certainly some some pockets, uh, and there always is every year across the the Corn Belt that that guys are feeling maybe a little bit behind. But I would say with the drier conditions, earlier harvest, uh, a little bit nicer fall across the Midwest, um, field bed prep fertilizer applications and like ron said some of those uh those burn down applications to get ahead of those winter annuals that's got to be a good feeling for a lot of folks i'm going to assume um ron that you expect weeds to come back this year Mm -hmm. and uh, a cold cold winter does take out insects but does it really make much difference on weed seed can not very much there is a little bit of winter annual stand loss, if you want to call it that, under certain conditions, but that's pretty rare. And with the snow cover that we have, that's even though we're dealing with sub-zero temperatures, that's going to have a, a pretty minimal effect on the weed population that's out there. Tell me, uh, if you would, what do you think uh, we're going to have to do in this time when herbicides don't work as well as they used to, to be able to really control these weeds coming into spring? Well, weed resistance is, you know, getting more. And in order to stay ahead of the weed populations, we really need to utilize all the tools that are in the toolbox, be it, uh, you know, genetically modified crops to utilize a broader range of chemistry or utilizing the early applications, the pre-emerge residual applications to get a good foundation program down. And that foundation program can is probably controlling 90, 95% of those weeds that, that will be coming for a period of a month or month and a half and getting us off to a really good start. Then follow up with a post-emerge application that also has residual so that we kill the weeds that escape the initial application, but then the residual carries us for another four to six weeks into the growing season until that crop shades the ground and and just the natural crop canopy cover helps assist with weed control after that. I think what all of you have said so far is you got to have some flexibility in this weed control. So, uh, Nate, do you agree with that? And 
how do you make it to where that you can move as you need to coming into spring to control weeds? Yeah, that flexibility uh, and some of the, the, the points that, that Ron was talking about, having that foundational control, I, I think they both go hand in hand. Um, when you talk about um, the ability of some of our more problematic weeds, specifically in, in, in my geography, we, we focus a lot on water hemp and, uh, you know, giant ragweed, maybe even some mare's tail from time to time. Uh, those weeds tend to come up over a wide range of, of conditions. You know, the mare's tail probably came up last fall. Uh, the giant ragweed for, for me comes up in, earlier in the springtime and water hemp comes up all year long. Uh, mm-hmm. You're not going to take care of that uh, with one application. Um, and you're not going to be able to take care of that with strictly post-emergence, you know, contact type products like, a, you know, a glufosinate or even residual um, products in one shot because eventually they, they wear out. Um, so when I talk about having some flexibility, I want products that regardless of weather, regardless of, of weed species, I want to have, you know, a nice one, two punch in there. I want to have a, a soil applied residual to take care of, of grasses and broadleaves. And I want to have some ability to, to knock down what's there because as, as Ron was mentioning, really for maximizing our yield, we want to make sure that we're making those applications at probably V2 to V4 or prior so that plant really ha- doesn't have a bad day from about V5 to V10. You know, that's the time where it's thinking about creating that ear length, thinking about creating the girth on the kernels. We don't want that plant to have a bad day. And if, has to, if it has to compete against grasses um, or, or broad leaves, it's going to have a bad day because it's taking sunlight, taking nutrients, and taking water. So the flexibility to have residual contact and control being able to, to apply them not only pre-emergence, but also being able to take some of those really strong products and apply them post-emergence is also really important. Ron, carry this a step further for me, if you would, on keeping this uh, portfolio of flexible products uh, out in front of you for post-emergence and pre-emergence. What do you recommend this spring? Okay, well, it, let's take what Nate just said. He, he really hit the nail on the head. You've got some weeds that germinated last fall. They're already in your field dormant right now. They're going to start greening up when it starts warming up. We've got other weeds like giant ragweed that as soon as it warms up, they're going to be starting new from new seed this spring. The day we plant the corn, those weeds are already going to be two, three, four, five, six inches tall. And that is hitting the limit of some of these herbicides' abilities to knock those down. So what we want to see out of our pre-emerge application is something that'll kill the weeds that are there and give us uh, extended residual beyond. Things like Keystone. We use a lot of Keystone in the state. Uh, A little bit of Sure Start, some Resicor. Those types of products will kill existing weeds and give us residual control. Now, when we turn to the post-emerge timing and you know, as farmers, we like to talk a lot about row and go. When you can row that corn, That's a good time to go with your post-emerge product. I understand at that time, those weeds aren't, you know, a foot tall. And I know they're not all up. But the post-emerge products that we're recommending, and here in Iowa, it's primarily Resicor. Some of it is Realm Q. But those post-emerge products uh, control the weeds that are up. But then they also give us four to six weeks of residual control to keep that field clean. It's easier to keep that field clean If we're spraying when the existing weeds are small, plus when you think of the spray coming out of that sprayer, 95% of that spray is getting to the soil, not getting tied up in tall corn or tall weeds, but it's getting on the soil. And when it's on the soil with a rainfall, you get a full dose of residual control. If we wait until the crop is a foot tall and the weeds are a foot tall, we're not going to get hardly any chemical to the soil. Therefore, we're not going to get hardly any residual out of those residual materials. Nate, talk to me about how important it is to have clean corn in this uh, V5 to V10 stage. Ken, I mean, that's that's kind of the the point that we've got to have all things working together. It's all got to be, you know, hitting six gear in that transmission. The the plants are now fully utilizing that nice um, nodal root system. We always call this that, you know, V6, V5 is the grand growth period. Um, and that's really the period when that corn is thinking about making how how long the ear is, 
um, where it's going to set that ear on the plant, as well as uh, how many rows around on that ear. And why that's really important is because if we don't set that potential or if we don't have that plant thinking, hey, I can make a 20 round by, you know, 40 long, you're never going to utilize that even if the rest of the season goes perfectly right. Um, and a lot of times we talk about nitrogen applications and making sure fertility balance is there. But if there's, if there's anything competing with that plant at any time, weeds um, specifically or, or diseases, uh, that plant's going to suffer. It's not going to, to sense that it has that potential. And uh, the reason why that row and go, the, you know, the, the pop-up when it's, you can row it and, and take your population uh, that Ron was talking about is so critical is because that plant is now signaling, okay, it's ready to get into high gear. We have a couple days, hopefully a week, to make sure that we get those herbicide applications on so that plant is free at V5 to V10. And usually by V10, plant is kind of... Uh, you know, just the, the canopy itself, it's growing so fast, it now kind of does a really good job of suppressing weeds just with the canopy, keeping it dark. But that time period in between, um, we, we need some help from some of our herbicides. We're talking with Nate LeVan, you're hearing now, from Pioneer and Ron Geis with Corteva AgriScience. And this podcast is brought to you by the Corn Herbicide Solutions from Corteva AgriScience. Ron, let me turn back to you and talk about... Uh, the kind of plants you see a lot of each year, but the ones you don't want to, what weeds are on your radar right now that you're most concerned about? We're most concerned about water hemp, uh, giant ragweed, which has been in eastern Iowa and it's moving its way west. And woolly cup grass has started to make a bit of a comeback. Now that's a grass. I thought we were able to control grasses pretty easily, or is this one that maybe just has slipped in? Nate, you want to comment on that? that that's the one I think I had the most calls on last year. Um, our, our residuals do a great job, but this is such a, a different grass type. Um, if those of you that have ever scouted, uh, look at, at woolly cup grass, it's such a bigger seed, right? And uh, it's, it's one that tends to come up later in the season. Well, if you think about the applications that we've been we've been talking about with some of our residual herbicides, um, most of them are focused a little bit earlier on the season. And a lot of times that seed, that energy in that big seed in woolly cupgrass allows it to kind of break through some of those at the tail end. And when we're focusing on giant ragweed and certainly water hemp, we're, we're focusing on a different uh, set of weed spectrum. If we focus on them with herbicides that are specific to broadleaves, sometimes that residual grass herbicide gets gets neglected. So yeah, woolly cupgrass, you know, years ago when we didn't have traded hybrids and were able to, to spray glyphosate or glufosinate, you know, it was a big issue. And now that now that we're focusing on broadleaf chemistries a little bit more, it seems like it's snuck back in there and, and that can take a ton of yield um, if left uncontrolled. So I would agree with you on that one snuck in on me the last couple of years. Well, it seems that nature uh, doesn't like a void, and uh, here I guess you are have created one, uh, Ron. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of a summer weed, I would say. It's a grass, but you've got to have some pretty good stretch on residual to get rid of it, or you got to do something else. Yeah, you do, Ken. Uh, years back, if we go back 20 years, we would have said that virtually all of the woolly cup grass would have emerged by June 1st. Those that are surviving today aren't even starting until maybe about the 10th of June, and they're getting a foothold. At that point, the residuals have usually run their course or getting close to running their course. One of the strategies is to border those fields at, with a later application of, of a glyphosate, which takes it out very simply, or bordering your fields with uh, additional acetochlor products like Keystone or, or uh, Surpass. That helps to give an extra kick where they tend to show up. The, the cup grass tends to be creeping in along the field edges and, and uh, oh, in the hills where they have terrace, uh, terrace areas. That's where we tend to see the cup grass coming in. Nate, uh, are we concerned still about weeds continuing to change and evolve ahead of the farmer? I think that's a constant struggle that we worry about. Um, weeds, insects, you know, diseases as, as we come up across, um, let's be honest, the, the, the knife edge on which we, which this crop lies, um, as, as yields get pushed higher and higher. And to be honest, the expectation anymore, um, is 50 bushels higher than it was, you know, 20 years ago 
that becomes more and more important. And, and as you see natural evolution, Mother Nature kind of finds its way. Being targeted and on time with effective control measures is, is so important. You know, that's, uh, that's something that a, a practice when you're not thinking about the ability to be flexible with that in-season application like Ron was talking about on Lily Cupgrass. Having the ability or the time or an applicator available to do that second application when that weed is most susceptible is so very important. Um, I, I still think that most of the time when we talk about weeds maybe coming through an application, it's usually due to environmental timing, poor coverage, uh, not enough water in the tank, um, or certainly spraying it at a, at, a, at a really hot day when the weeds aren't actively taking up the herbicides. There's a lot of those that go on. But certainly poor timing when you're trying to control a 12 inch weed when on label it says that up to three to four, you know, that's just a recipe for, for getting more resistance to, to come up um, as we continue to, to fight these weeds. Gentlemen, as we wrap up here, uh, any special concerns that farmers need to be aware of going into this spring, uh, Nate? So we had a pretty dry end of the year, especially in the western half of the, the territory that I cover. And really across um, you know across the, the United States, you look at the drought monitor, it's creeping up there. But for us, I'm reminded of um, you know locally in 2013, and I, I do believe that there's um, you know some other instances in Illinois, you know 2018, 2019. Um, we can change that awful quickly. We can go from being too dry to to too wet very quickly in a very short period of time. So um, you know other than that, no, I, I'm really happy with the way field. Prep is. I mean, I think we have a really good shot at establishing a good seed bed um, and making some good planter passes. You know, that ever important planter pass is so key. So I think guys are going to be in a good position to, to make an effective um, planting pass. Um, but in terms of what's on everybody's mind now, is is the the, the dryness, um, and certainly when it comes to herbicides, we want to make sure that those herbicides have time to activate. Um, and, uh, you know, if we have a dry spring, some of those, some of those residuals that we talked about may struggle to get activated. But other than that, let's get this cold out of here and, and hopefully get the 20, uh, 21 season off to a good start. Yeah. I'm, I'm going <laughs> for that goal to be out of here. Ron, what about you? <laughs> Same question. What do you expect that people should be especially concerned about this spring? Some of the weather forecasts are calling for a little bit warmer than normal March, April, and May. And that's usually great news because we're able to get the corn planted on a very timely basis and even get some soybeans planted early. But uh, flexibility in your weed control is real important, especially if we're able to just hammer through and get the corn planted and then the beans. Uh, Somewhere along the line there, boys, we've got to get this uh, herbicide put out. Uh, Building a good plan A, which is put down a good residual herbicide at planting or near planting time and follow up with a a relatively early post-emerge, that's our best plan, our most effective plan, the most weatherproof plan. If that plan doesn't work out right, switch to your plan B, which is, you know, many times our herbicides, like a a keystone, like a reservoir, can be used pre-emerge or post-emerge, but then it still may require a second follow-up if that initial application actually goes on corn that's emerged, it may still take a second application later on just to get enough residual to take it through to canopy cover. Just just be flexible. Well, let's give people a chance to get a little bit more help after they've uh, listened to this. Ron, do you have a website that you'd recommend? We have the Corteva.us website and then also uh, poweroverweeds.com. Encourage people to see their authorized Corteva retailer. Uh, with any chemical questions or, of course, contact any of us. Nate, what about you? Any website you'd recommend? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of good electronical um, resources. Uh, Pioneer.com, great, um, great resource for a lot of different agronomic topics. Um, and there's the Pioneer Seeds app. That's one that uh, is free of charge. It offers some great tips on, uh, on scouting for different weeds. There's kind of an, a unique uh, disease control option for when we want to talk about fun- fungicide applications later on in the season, you know, specifically things on uh, you know, corn and soybeans and even some small grains. So uh, those are great places to start. And, of course, your local Pioneer sales representative going to give you a, a really good ability to, to talk through some of these herbicides like, like Resilcor and, and some of the, uh, the other options that we have. Uh, across uh, across their growing area. They're going to be able to give you that local expertise on what's worked for them and their customers. So, And if you have any questions, you can certainly go to those folks or the website. 
Well, it's about showtime. I know that it's still cold, but uh, we're looking for spring to pop, and some of the uh, southern latitudes are going to see it real soon. Nate LeVan, thank you very much. Ron Geis, thank you. And thank you, folks, for joining us today. To learn more about the corn herbicide solutions from Corteva AgriScience, we recommend you go to poweroverweeds.com.